Tape's cheap. <laughs> no, nothing's cheap. Um, I'm sure you've done lots of, well, I've seen you do this on TV, so uh, that'll be fine. You know what's going to happen. I'm sure I'll just give you a little push and you'll just start going. We're going to do a little interview, Gary. Maybe you can kind of want, that's really greater. Thank you. That's so much better. Okay. And maybe, Gary, you could close those doors just for a minute. And maybe the... <laughs> See, I'm used to being a producer, a nasty, bushy, pushy. Go for it. That's Greg. And you're Craig. Greg. Greg, actually. okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, and welcome to Gay TV. Today we're talking with Mel White, who was once a conservative ghostwriter for uh, people such as Oliver North, Jerry Falwell, and Pat Robertson. And he uh, spent 25 years in a marriage to a woman and has subsequently come out as a gay fellow and uh, now looks back on those years in a book which he has published called Stranger at the Gate. Welcome to our show. Thanks, Greg. And uh, tell me, where did this title, Stranger at the Gate, come from? Well, it's an interesting reference to Matthew, Jesus' words, when he said to the disciples, be careful, because in the last judgment, you're going to be judged for leaving strangers at the gate, not welcoming them in. And I think that's what the church is doing today, both Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish, for the most part, are simply saying to gay and lesbian people, you're not welcome here. Mm -hmm. So the stranger at the gate, to be gay and Christian in America, is saying, uh, that's not what God has in mind. Uh, as you look back on your years as a conservative writer, um, do you have any comments to make about uh, uh, how you would do things differently now? Or Well, actually, my agent was Irving Lazar, and my publisher was Simon Schuster, and I was hired to do various people's autobiographies as a ghostwriter. Mm -hmm. And they just happened to hire me for Jerry Falwell's autobiography and for a book by Billy Graham and so forth. So. I was never really in their camps writing their ideological stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness, mm -hmm. I couldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. But to write their stories, I felt like their stories are as interesting as anybody else's. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of my gay friends are saying, how much damage did you do while you were in there? And I think all of us who have to live in closets while we're there participate in the damage that mm -hmm. those people who require closets are doing. So I take my share of blame. I, I'm sorry for the years that I spent, not just because of the damage I might have done, but because they were wasted years. Mm -hmm. Closets are often wasted years. I'm glad I'm out now, and I'm glad I can celebrate my sexuality instead of condemn it like I did in those days. Uh, my experience is exactly the same, but I realized I was gay when I was 18, and until 28, I was doing everything possible to deny it, yeah. and I look back with resentment on those years of just what a total waste uh, what agony I went through, and uh, in parallel, I, by being in the closet, I supported the lies concerning gays, and I, I helped maintain that standard, and, and uh, I'm not doing that anymore, and I feel a lot better I, about it. I don't look back on the years as totally wasted, though. For example, my relationship with Lila for 24 years was rich and productive. Mm -hmm. Having two children, watching those children grow, having a granddaughter now, I think that all of that was a part of the good life for me. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very difficult time for me to say it's time that I go on and be and celebrate my, my homosexuality. But it was painful because there were so many good things about that life too. And people who come out have to deal with that. We give up great loss as well as we get great gain. Do you have any recommendations for people who are um, having to deal with uh, the religious right, you know, maybe somebody brings some Bible quotes to confront a gay person. Dueling Bibles. Dueling Bibles, yes. Yeah. Dueling Bibles. <laughs> uh, what do you recommend that uh, the gay person do? A gay person, in my estimation, a lesbian, a bisexual person who wants to argue about the Bible passages is doomed uh, to gloom. <laughs> it's not going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help the person who's misusing the text mm -hmm. to hear us turn around and try to batter down the misused text. We just go endlessly then around and around. For me, my commitment to the Bible is obvious. I got a doctorate in religion. I had to learn Hebrew to study the Old Testament, I had to learn Greek to study the New. I love the Bible. I teach from it, I preach from it, I read it every day, I memorize it. 
But those six passages that they're misusing mm -hmm. against us mm -hmm. should simply be smiled at and rejected. Mm -hmm. The fact is there's no such word as homosexuality in the Old or New Testament. The behaviors that the Bible writers condemn, whether it's Sodom's gang rape or if it's Paul's temple prostitution, mm -hmm. gay and lesbian people are against those things now. Mm -hmm. So I simply say, hey, we agree with those passages. Uh, that always short circuits the conversation. Remember, the Bible has been misused to condemn good things for thousands of years. The, the Bible was misused to support slavery. In fact, Jerry Falwell wasn't letting black people into his church until 1964, and he called the civil rights movement the civil wrongs movement, and he quoted scriptures, just like he's quoting scriptures today. So I would say, don't give up on the Bible. It's still trustworthy as a spiritual guide, but give up on those people who are misusing it and simply say, look, let's agree to disagree about this and go on with our lives. You say the gang rape of Sodom, uh, is that what the story of Sodom's about? Can you explain you that a little bit? You're going to do dueling Bibles after what I just said? I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with you. I, I was just giving you an opportunity to explain that a little further. I don't think Sodom has anything to do with homosexuality whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But then I say, okay, it's a, let's just say you're right, that it's every man and boy in this ancient Near Eastern city is mm -hmm. gay. Mm -hmm. Just assume. Mm -hmm. Every man, okay, hard assumption to make. Mm -hmm. And one night they decide all together to come on this town at, to this little house and rape two angels, okay? Mm -hmm. That's pretty hard, too. Mm -hmm. But if that's true, this is about gang rape. So I condemn every gay man and every gay boy in Sodom mm -hmm. and say, I'm not a Sodomite. Of course, that's not anything to do with what that passage is about. Five Old Testament prophets and Jesus all told us what the text was about. And even Jesus said nothing about sexuality. It was about what they did in those days. And what they did in those days was to dehumanize people who were strangers, mm -hmm. aliens. They dehumanized them by all kinds of problems, including mass rape. Mm -hmm. And so here were heterosexuals, very likely, threatening to rape these strangers because they didn't know them. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with us whatsoever. I know a lot of gays and lesbians are deeply troubled by what they believe is in the Bible. Oh, yeah. And I would just recommend go back and read the story of Sodom. Yeah. And, and, it's and see how little it has to do with us. Right. And right. the Sodomites, the real Sodomites, are people who leave us as strangers, who treat us as aliens. Mm -hmm. Jerry Falwell is a Sodomite. Pat Robertson is a Sodomite. That's the Sodomites. And read the biblical stories. Jesus said to his disciples, if you go into a city where they treat you like that, dust your sandals off and move out, they're Sodomites. Leave them behind leave completely them behind. and don't, don't think about them anymore. Uh, how has the reception to your book been from bookstores and so on? Is, have you had any problems with that? Well, in, in mainline bookstores, secular bookstores, it's a bestseller. But Christian booksellers won't have it. So 6,000 of America's Christian Booksellers Association stores refuse to have it. Even though it's about spirituality, it's about my commitment to God, it's about my love for the Creator, it's about homosexual people coming back to their own spiritual journeys. It's everything that it should be in a Christian bookstore, but they boycotted it. Whereas all these wonderful mainline stores, my wife, I have to tell you this story, my wife went into a bookstore in a mall in a hurry one day, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a Christian bookstore. Mm -hmm. And she yelled, shouts across the way, is there a real bookstore in this mall? <laughs> I, I'm telling you, when, when a bookstore even, or a library censors like that, mm -hmm. I don't think they'd be considered themselves real bookstores anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about your wife. Uh, I understand she wrote the foreword yeah. to your book. So uh, uh, you still have a good relationship with her, which I'm very happy. I've just come, to, well, yesterday from San Francisco where she was installed as the chief of developments at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so the children were there, the grandchild, and we were there to celebrate my wife's canon. She's become a canon in the Apple School Church. Um, we love each other. Mm -hmm. And after 24 years of trying to be repaired, reparative therapy, I took electric shock treatments, I took aversive therapy where they gave you little Allen pills. I did everything to overcome. Once she and I realized that sexuality, homo or hetero, is a gift from God, mm -hmm. that you celebrate it, that you embrace it, she said, it's time for us to go. We've made a mistake. And that took some real grace and some courage. I know Over. when uh, I... One of the things that helped me accept my homosexuality was uh, the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done. Yeah, right. And I had been saying that a lot 
the thing. I want it done my way. <laughs> yeah, right. Or the way society dictates, you know? They mm -hmm. say it's evil to be gay. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to say, it isn't evil to be gay. And whatever you heard, it's a lie. It's misinformation. And I lived with that lie for 35 miserable years, but thank God I'm free of that lie now. Now I say, God created me this way. But once you accept your gift, sexual orientation, from God, then you have to live it with integrity. And you know, when you're in the closet, cut off from God, you can say, hey, why well, I, I can do whatever I want to do. But in fact, I think it's wonderful now to know that not only does God love it, but God is excited about using it wisely and well. And give, give me a practical example of what you mean by that. Right? Well, for example, gay people like straight people have a tendency to think that sex is something we separate for a Friday night. Mm -hmm. Or for after a lot of um, you know gin fizzes, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. we just kind of do what comes naturally. In mm -hmm. fact, I love sexuality. You know, my partner and I, Gary Nixon, for you know, the last ten years, we celebrate our sexuality. And even though I'm getting old and tired, we still embrace sexuality and sex acts. Mm -hmm. But to do something with someone who's ir that's irresponsible, to take advantage of somebody's drunkenness <laughs> or mm -hmm. need, you know, mm -hmm. to use a person. It is not God's dream for us. And, 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 I, and I don't want to give saying what is sexually right for anybody else. Mm -hmm. That's a very personal journey. Mm -hmm. But that there are things that are demeaning, mm -hmm. dehumanizing, destructive, and that we need to constantly be aware that God loves when we celebrate and act with responsibility and is sad when we live beneath what we could become as gay or straight people. Well, it, that brings up a whole lot of crap, you know. People think, oh boy, here he goes. You know, you can't do this, you can't do that. I'm not saying you can't do I'm saying what you can do. Be I feel like there are, if, even if we don't want to put rules yeah. on everybody else's uh, sexuality, uh, there are consequences. And uh, those consequences are going to uh, go on whether I have said anything about them or you have or That's not. Right. Right. And right now with AIDS and... Um, you know, as the most dramatic example, uh, behaving irresponsibly concerning sex is, has very, very serious consequences. Can have you. And we also have uh, lifetimes without real love that can happen if it's just picking up a trick on the weekends and, you know, 20 minutes later you never see them again. Uh, I, I think they're, they're the consequences of just missing out on the possibilities that we could have for our lives. I'm all for, you know, I've had a long-term relationship just like you have, and uh, I but just... But I did some tricking, too. Oh, I well. mean, when I was coming out, that was all a part of who I was and trying to find out. And, you know, I, I look back on some of those irresponsible times as being really a part of my growth process. So for me to f condemn anybody, I just, I say, let's not condemn each other, but let's be alert. Mm -hmm. Let's be responsible. Let's talk about the issues. Mm -hmm. Where does this lead? What does this, you know? Uh, but, but.